Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome. So how are you doing today? Good? Yeah? It's a wonderful day, isn't it? Well, let me fix that for you. I'll talk about jobs. Can I have, please, a quick show of hands? Raise your hand if you either work or if you know somebody close to you who works in any of these areas. How about driving? That's trucks, delivery, buses, taxes, anything. Raise your hand. Uh, how about uh, janitors, house cleaning, uh, cashiers, uh, or no one? No one knows anyone who works? OK, good. <laughs> Secretaries, real estate, accounting, retail, manufacturing, journalism. OK, I'd say about 70% of you. Good. Good. Robots will steal your job. Laughter, ridicule, contempt. This is how I was greeted by the establishment of economists about four years ago when I first started thinking about these issues. At the time, I helped start an organization called the Zeitgeist Movement, and we were thinking of ways on how to build a better society. Now, at the time, nobody took us seriously, but uh, things have changed now. What changed? Well, very few people are laughing. 2009, Martin Ford comes out with lights in the tunnel, where he paints a picture of an increasingly automated economy. Lots of jobs are being replaced by machines, and very few new jobs are being created. 2011, two MIT economists, they have pretty much the same thesis. So let's look at the evidence for this, shall we? Kodak, the once undisputed giant of the photography industry, they had a 90% market share in the US in 1976. By the year 1984, they were employing 145,000 people. And in 2012, they had a net worth of negative a billion dollars when they went bankrupt. Why? Because they failed to predict the importance of exponential trends when it comes to technology. On the other hand, Instagram, a digital photography company, the same year, 2012, they had 13 employees and they were sold to Facebook for a billion dollars. Now, this is kind of ironic because Kodak pioneered digital photography. They actually invented the first digital camera when they came out in 1975 with the 0.01 megapixel digital camera. But they thought it was a toy and didn't pay attention. So that's what happens with exponentials. We don't pay attention. So let's play a little game with you. Let's be a more interactive. It's called 30 Steps. Now, imagine I take 30 steps linearly. That's one, two, three. Where do I get if I get to 30? About the end of the stage right there. OK. How about if I take 30 steps exponentially? 2, 4, 8, 16. Where do I get? Where? Outside? Actually, I get to the moon. By the way, this is not to scale. The moon is much farther away. <laughs> and back. And I still have enough steps to circle the Earth eight times over. That's what exponential means. How do I know this? I just asked the Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> now, Foxconn, the world's largest manufacturer of electronic components, they make pretty much anything. So if you've got something on your lap or on your pocket that makes noises and you know, it's blinking and bright and probably it's tweeting right now, they made it. Not just Apple, they make anything. It's a multinational corporation worth $100 billion, which employs 1.2 million people. What are they doing? They're automating, of course. In fact, they're about to deploy an army of 1 million robots to cut rising labor expenses and improve efficiency. Canon is doing the same, going fully automated very soon. Lots of other companies are following. Now, what if Walmart follows? Biggest multinational corporation in the world employs 2.1 million people. What if they automate? Well, they can't, right? They don't have the technology to do that. Oh, it most certainly do. Amazon knows this very well. So this is a graph made by a fellow author, um, Andrew McAfee from MIT. We pretty much agree on the analysis. As you, as you can see, profits, investments, they're all going up and up and up for corporate investments and multinational corporations. But the red line, which is the employment to population ratio, is going down and down and down. And we both agree that when it comes to automation, we ain't seen nothing yet. This is the Google autonomous car. You know, the futuristic car that drives itself without a human driver? Yeah. It's, by the way, it's as cool as it sounds. I was inside. This is me at NASA a few months ago. 
And it's a pretty neat piece of technology. They have all sorts of sensors and lasers and GPS and machine learning algorithms. It drives itself. It's safer, better than any human driver. It doesn't get tired, follow every street rule, never crashes, never breaks any rule whatsoever. Basically, it just works, and it's better than humans. Problem is, 3.6 million people in the United States alone work driving. I mean, they drive for a living. That's 2.6% of the population. Austria and Europe, they have very similar numbers. I think these people might be affected by this kind of, te this kind of technology, don't you? So accounting, retail, manufacturing, uh, translations, uh, no one is safe. Journalism, as the Wall Street jour no Journal puts it, software is eating the world. So what do we do? Should we despair? How about putting taxes on technology? Or impose more regulation? Or maybe do some education reforms? So basically, find any clever ways to get everyone a damn job. That's what these guys are proposing. That's what the presidential campaign is all about. And it sounds reasonable enough. After all, fa famously said by Voltaire, is the sentence, work saves us from three great evils. Boredom, vice, and need. He said that in 1759. But is that really the case? Today, in this society, I think we might be missing a big opportunity. It was Confucius who said that if you choose a job you love, you never have to work a day in your life. Brilliant. I agree. Problem, getting a job you love, one that is fulfilling, and that allows you to follow your moral code today, I don't know about you, but it's pretty damn hard. In fact, according to the Luat Shift Index, as much as 80% of the people hate their job. 80%. That's four out of five spending most of their useful lifetime doing something they don't particularly enjoy. Now, in 2012, with this kind of technology at our fingertips, guys, but doesn't that make you a little mad? A little bit? And so we are in a kind of a work paradox. Because we work long and hard hours on jobs we hate, to buy things we don't need, to impress people we don't like. <laughs> Genius. And so we have to adjust to what the economy allows us to perform. And the sad reality is that most jobs, unfortunately, are neither fulfilling nor do they create any value for society. And I don't think I have to name which jobs. I think you know which ones. By the way, they're going to be automated very soon, and I suspect within our lifetime. So we're screwed. That's the end of my talk. Bye. <laughs> now, I think there is light in the tunnel because I spent years researching this problem, and I think I might have cracked it. I might have discovered what the purpose of life is. <laughs> and I'm going to give it to you right now, TEDx Vienna. Would you like to know? OK, <clears throat> here it goes. The purpose of life is <clears throat> the to have robots steal your job. <laughs> All right, let's be serious. I suppose I don't know my purpose, let alone your purpose or that of anyone else, but I'm pretty sure what the purpose of life is not. And the purpose of life cannot be to work, produce, and consume more and more and more. So here is a radical idea. The goal of the future is full unemployment, so we can play. That's why we have to destroy the present political economic system. This is no light statement, considering it comes from legendary author and futurist Arthur C. Clarke. You see, I think we must do away with the absolutely spacious notion that everybody has to earn a living. It is a fact today that one in 10,000 can create the technological breakthrough capable of supporting all the rest. And so the youth of today are absolutely right in recognizing this nonsense of earning a living. And so we keep inventing new jobs because of this false idea that everyone has to be employed at some kind of a drudgery or another, because according to Darwinian Malthusian theory, they must justify their right to exist. And so we have inspector 
inspectors of inspectors and people making instruments for inspectors to inspect inspectors. The true business of people should be to go back to school and think about whatever they were thinking about before somebody came along and told them they had to earn a living. I know what you're thinking. These are naive words. Words of a young mind, oblivious to the intricate and complex uh, fabric of society and economic system. That might be true. Good thing they're not my words, though, but that of genius futurist Buck Mr. Fuller, interviewed in 1970 by New York Magazine. Now, okay, this is all very nice, but look, we've got to face reality, okay? Tomorrow, we've got to go to work. Well, tomorrow is Sunday, but uh, on Monday, we've got to go to work. Um, we buy food, pay the rent, pay the bills. Look, you, can, you can't just, you know, leave everything. So how do you solve this problem now? As I said, I spent years researching this problem. So here's the short answer. There is no short answer. That's why I wrote a book <laughs> to explain this. And I spent the last years traveling some 20 countries. I went to NASA. I studied at Singularity University. And I spoke with some of the greatest minds on this planet to tackle this problem. As it turns out, you need a plan. And not just any plan, you need a multi-year plan that involves lots of people, and everyone has a different plan. So it's pretty complicated, um, kind of short in time, and they told me to keep it simple, the TED guys. So I made a picture of two possible futures. To the left, we've got exponential technologies and limited resources. I think that's a fair assumption to make. We add the need for growth and labor for income. That's the basis of every society today. To me, in a few years, that equals to mass unemployment, runaway climate change, resource depletion, starvation, worldwide violence, and civil unrests. Not too nice. To the right, we still have exponential technologies and limited resources. We can't really change that unless we obliterate the human race or break the laws of physics. But what we can change is our attitude, our goals, and our purpose. Open source, DIY innovator, self-sustaining communities. I think this will redefine the idea of work. By letting go of the idea of infinite growth and labor for income, we can use our ingenuity. Instead of finding clever ways to get everyone a new job, maybe useless, we can use the same ingenuity to work less, have more free time, have more fulfilling lives, restore global resource balance, and generally have a more resilient system. So, aha, uh -huh. you, sir, are a techno-utopian. You believe technology solves everything. That's what everyone tells me. To the contrary, I believe technology is merely a facilitator of your intention. Look back to the picture. If you subscribe to the idea that we have infinite needs that require an infinite amount of work and infinite growth, to be satisfied, which, by the way, is impossible. Exponential technology will help you get there exponentially faster to these awful results. OK, but we've been living like this for thousands of years. Are we supposed to just give that up? Isn't that against human nature? Well, we had slavery for thousands of years. We gave that up. I believe we are at the dawn of a new civilization. But we can only evolve as a society if we are ready to accept that some of the assumptions that we most hold dear, we have to let go of them. Technology was never meant to increase productivity and growth so we can work longer hours anywhere, anytime, on any device. That's insanity. It was meant to make our lives better. And by the way, this isn't anything new. People have been talking about this for ages. Aristotle, 2,300 years ago, said exactly the same thing. So why is that, hasn't this happened in 2,300 years? Well, I believe you need three conditions satisfied in order to achieve massive social change. You need the vision, the resources, and the technology to fulfill your dreams. So in the past, we had the vision and the resources, but we didn't have the technology. And now we have the resources for a little more still, and we certainly have the technology, but we've lost our way. I believe we are fighting a lost battle. We can't win against nature and its limited resources. We depend on nature. 
And we certainly can't win against robots and AI and their exponentially increasing intelligence. But we can win with them. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, we have many challenges ahead of us as a species, among which runaway climate change, increasing inequality and massive unemployment. And I believe we can solve all of these challenges and more if we change our vision, our perspective, our focus, what drives our lives. And so I wrote this book, which is called Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's OK. And it can be more than OK. It can be marvelous. I believe every human being is an invaluable masterpiece from the moment they're born. And we, as a species, we are meant for great things, greater than we can even conceive right now with our limited brains. And compulsory work for the sake of survival is an obstacle that prevents us from achieving these goals. And so since then, I started giving speeches and talks around the world, and I co-founded a benefit corporation with other three extraordinary individuals from NASA and Singularity University that I hope will inspire people to do just that, to make this world a reality to express their full cognitive and intellectual potential. And then I look back to my past, and I realize I'm 26 years old, almost 27. <sighs> I'm getting old. <laughs> and then I look at the future, and I say this. And I would really love to create a future that I can be proud of to create a future where one day my kids will grow in. Thank you very much. <laughs>